This is going to be the longest long-term review I've done probably ever. So this is the MacBook Pro, specifically my MacBook Pro, the late 2021 16-inch model. When I picked it up three Prime Ministers and one-sixth of a Duke Nukem Forever ago, it was the base model of Apple's top-end MacBook. And almost every video I've created for this channel has been produced on this MacBook. Or to put it in the parlance of the tech media dork, this is my daily driver. But with new M4-based MacBook Pros already available by the time you watch this, I'm finally considering whether it's time for an upgrade. Because we've reached that point in the release cycle where those incremental generational performance improvements over the years are starting to stack up. So I'm going to take you through what I've learned using this MacBook since the middle of 2022 as it's been battle-tested through the production of hundreds of videos in half a dozen countries. Let's dive in. Starting off, the first big decision you need to make when choosing a new MacBook Pro is which size to go for, 14 inch or 16 inch. I went 16 mainly for battery related reasons, but this was probably the first mistake I made on my Apple Silicon MacBook journey. See, before switching to this machine, I used a 2018 Intel Core i7 MacBook Pro. You know, the ones with the LED touch bar that everyone hated and the dreaded butterfly keyboard, so named because it too would start dying after one to two weeks. Older Intel laptops issues with thermals and battery life are well known to say the least, and after travelling with that device and editing video on it, I was so sick of its battery issues that I opted for the larger size of M1 Pro just so I could be absolutely sure of the longest possible range between chargers. On the plus side, the kind of battery life this laptop could deliver in late 2021, early 2022 was a revelation. Just being able to sit on the sofa or train or airplane for multiple hours at a time editing video without even thinking about the battery level was something I was totally unaccustomed to, and delivered the same excellent performance on battery as it did when it was plugged into the wall, something Intel laptops still grapple with to this day. The other side of that coin is this 16-incher is every bit as much of a tank as my previous 2018 model. That's not a huge deal when it's sat at a desk hooked up to an external monitor, but it does make this much less of a portable computer when I need to take it on the road. It tips the scales at 2.1 kilos, or for American viewers, the equivalent of a juvenile Virginia opossum that you're lugging around on your back whenever you carry this device. So if I'm looking at an M4 Pro upgrade, I'd definitely go 14 inch this time around, even if at 1.6 kilos, it's also not exactly lightweight. I've reviewed a bunch of other notebooks around this footprint, and I definitely think 14 is the sweet spot for portability. Meanwhile, Apple Silicon remains so efficient that even the smaller cell in the 14 incher is going to get battery life that far outclasses most of the Intel competition, with the possible exception of the latest Lunar Lake chips. And speaking of battery, I'm still at 97% capacity on my original cell two and a half years after picking this machine up, with 83 charge cycles. Obviously, I'm working plugged in and connected to a monitor most of the time, but that's still not too shabby, likely helped along by the battery saving feature that holds the charge at 80% when it's used on AC for extended periods. So over more than two years of daily use, it's natural for any notebook to pick up wear and tear, and probably the most noticeable signs of use on my MacBook Pro can be found on the keyboard. Years of exposure to finger grease have brushed away the matte texture of many of these keys. The keys themselves are all fine, by the way, no mushiness or noticeable degradation in a key travel, and certainly no missed key presses or double presses or any of that nonsense that I remember from the butterfly keyboard days. Otherwise, there's not much that I've exposed this laptop to that a little alcohol wipe and some elbow grease haven't been able to remedy. Even the sharp edge of the bottom of the lid here, notorious for picking up scratches from watch straps or other jewellery, has fared pretty well. And the lack of any scratches in general here is likely partly due to my choice of the silver colour versus space grey. Both the speakers and display are in decent nick too and still competitive with what's on the market today, which is good because I have had friends' MacBooks experience some speaker issues over time, in one case involving the speaker and a Pro being completely blown out in less than a year. My note still works great and still sounds fine. The display notch up here continues to be an incomprehensible blemish on this otherwise slick design, and one that applies just as much to the latest models as it does to my old M1 Pro. I seriously don't know why you'd have this here if it doesn't even do Face ID, especially considering the enormous size of this camera module. What I will say though is that you do stop noticing it consciously after a while, especially in my case when I've often had it hooked up to an external monitor, so half the time I'm looking at a different display anyway. 
Something else I can say for this screen is it has successfully withstood the oily keyboard wearing of my previous two MacBook Pros, where carrying it with the lid closed would often cause the keyboard to erode the coating of the screen through the oil that was carried on those keys. It is a well-known issue with some earlier MacBooks that I thankfully haven't encountered on this one so far. So performance, and here's where I get to my second mea culpa with this laptop, because I almost certainly made a rookie error when I was specking out this machine. I went with the off-the-shelf 16 plus 512 gig model, in part to avoid the lengthy delays involved with a custom build around the time that I ordered it, and in part because budgets are a thing, and custom higher spec MacBook builds can very quickly start to get extremely pricey. For what is primarily a video editing machine, 512 internal storage might seem pretty anemic, but I'd be editing from external storage most of the time anyway. And as for the 16GB of RAM, I guess my brain was still kind of living in the late 2010s when that was considered a reasonable amount of memory. I guess I also had the personal experience of 16 gigs on Mac OS being fine enough for video editing in a way that it definitely is not on the Windows side where 32 gigs is a minimum for 4K editing. Seems to have to do with the way Mac OS pages between RAM and internal storage. For me, the M1 Pro seemed like the sweet spot for performance versus the more expensive and power-hungry M1 Max, and for the most part it's been more than up to the task of handling the kinds of videos I've thrown at it in Premiere Pro. 4K timelines and source footage that's somewhere between 4K at 30fps and 6K at 60 when editing heavier projects, this MacBook will definitely page quite a lot, even if you don't notice it, just look in Activity Manager here. That's especially true in Premiere Pro in timelines with lots of layers or with nested sequences. And while slowdown is relatively rare, it can happen on this Mac, and when it does it feels more like it has to do with memory than necessarily the chip itself, not least because the machine isn't generating much heat, nor is it firing up its fans. Obviously, for everything I do besides editing video, this M1 MacBook Pro is still pretty much overkill. The machine is all but silent outside of the time I'm actually rendering final exports of videos, and I've still yet to encounter any Windows computer that can match that level of overall performance without going into full vacuum cleaner mode. The closest probably is Qualcomm's Snapdragon X Elite. And even the webcam in that unsightly notch often takes better looking footage most of the time than many more recent Windows laptops I've used where they've had to cram smaller sensors into their thinner bezels. When I'm using this machine for work, most of the time it's plugged into a Huawei MateView 28.2 inch monitor, a 3x2 display that's basically 4K and change in terms of resolution, in addition to the built-in 2.8K panel. This monitor can charge connected devices at up to 65 watts, which most of the time is more than enough for this MacBook, even though its bundled charging brick is rated for up to 140 watts. I've actually only seen the battery drop down when it's plugged into this monitor on very rare occasions where it's exporting larger videos. So it's pretty nice to not have to mess around with separate charging and display cables, and as a result I don't think I've ever used the MagSafe port on the left edge or the full-sized HDMI over on the right. It's one of the little quality of life features I appreciate about this MacBook that doesn't apply to some beefier Windows laptops which can draw excessive amounts of power even when plugged into a display like this. The second biggest quality of life factor for me for this Mac, after I think the chip itself, is the trackpad. Firstly, it's just enormous, which definitely helps, but still, the responsiveness of this trackpad more than makes up for the lack of a touchscreen in modern Macs for the kind of work that I do. Being able to smoothly pinch to zoom and precisely scroll with minimal effort, all while getting haptic feedback when navigating through timelines in Premiere Pro, is an experience that on Windows I still can't replicate. And when I go back to editing on a Windows machine that I might be testing, for example, I just need to use a mouse because the trackpad experience on most Windows laptops is still so bad compared to the MacBooks. I can only assume that patents are the reason why no other manufacturer has been able to match this after almost a decade. As for macOS itself, I'm honestly pretty ambivalent about Apple's OS. It's fine, it's mostly just there and gets the job done without getting in my way too much. That's something I can't always say about Windows laptops with their various sidebars and widget panels. But even though I use an iPhone more than half the time these days, I don't find that ecosystem draw is much of a big deal for me in this MacBook. Compared to my iPhone, this is more just a tool for getting a job done. AirDrop is useful, sure, but third-party solutions like LocalShare work just fine across platforms. I also appreciate continuity, mainly for clipboard sharing between iPhone and Mac, but it's far from an everyday performance boom. 
And iPhone mirroring new in macOS Sequoia is very neat from a technical perspective, but what's probably affected my workflow more has been window snapping finally coming to macOS in the 2024 release. Again, we likely have patents to thank for that taking so long to arrive. So my main computer is now three generations old, and the M4 chip in Apple's latest products would very likely give me a noticeable performance bump in the more computationally heavy parts of what I do. Even so, the real limitations of this Mac are probably things I could have and should have foreseen a couple of years ago. As I said, the M1 chip still crushes in terms of performance, but three generations on, it's RAM and to a lesser extent storage that's cramping this machine's style. 512 gigs of storage means I'm swapping locally stored projects around more often than I otherwise would be. That's not a huge deal. Like I said, I'm mostly editing from external Thunderbolt or USB 3.2 drives anyway. The extra breathing space would be nice and would mean I'm not constantly having to declutter the assorted gunk that my Adobe apps inevitably like to gum up macOS's internal file structure with. With the advent of Apple Silicon, Macs have never been less upgradable than they are right now, which only underscores the importance of getting the right spec at the time you buy. That's especially true for RAM, where a small investment could add additional years to the lifespan of your device. The equivalent upgrade from 24 to 48 gigabytes on a modern 16 inch MacBook Pro would add $400 to your price. Not a small amount of money, but consider the extra longevity. If I'd gone 32 gig when specking out my machine, I'd be looking at upgrading after four or five, maybe even six years, not three or four. Because otherwise, this three year old model has aged shockingly well and has become my favorite computer that I think I've ever used. If you're using an earlier Apple Silicon Mac like this, let me know in the comments how you're getting on with it. Any regrets with your purchase? Stick around and subscribe on YouTube as we're going to be digging into more of the new Intel laptops very soon. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.